Malina Germek. She's assistant in the field of philosophy and her areas of interest are epistemology and science and epistemology of art. And the title of her talk is <laughs> Anatomical Body and Alienation. Magdalena, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So yeah, uh, you can probably conclude from the title of my presentation that we will encounter anatomy in this uh, lecture. Now, you can, of course, ask me what anatomy is doing at a philosophical conference, a conference where we operate with pure thought, as Gregor Moder put it in his welcome speech. <laughs> well, actually, I don't know. Um, maybe anatomy has nothing to do with pure thinking, whatever that pure thinking is. Maybe it has to do with dirty, impure thinking, because it deals with something that is very dirty, that stinks and that provokes disgust with a dead body. But then again, maybe thinking about impurity is the right step to thinking about purity. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> Instead of looking for the principles of visual thinking in neurocognitive disciplines, I'm interested in the French epistemological traditions, under which I count well-known names such as Michel Foucault, Gaston Bachelard, Georges Canguilhem, of course, Louis Althusser, Alain Badiou, Dominique Lecour, etc. Although these authors did not think about the epistemology of science in connection with scientific visual, visual thinking, they are important to me because they approach epistemology rationalistically, materialistically, and historically. Unfortunately, I cannot go into the explanation of what that exactly means, uh, not today. Um, however, when it comes to visual epistemology, it can be said that it is closely related to visual studies, Bild Wissenschaft, which appeared in the 1990s as an iconic term, which claims that visual thinking is not only a translation of linguistic form into the visual one, but has its own principles. Now, in the recent years, there has also been a new tendency which explores the meaning and the role of the visual that visual has for science. For example, whether scientific diagrams, schemes, uh, scientific illustrations are only a tool, a didactic tool for illustrating the scientific text, or whether they have an independent epistemological value. Of course, this is not something radically new, because it is enough to look at the topological figures of the late Lacan, and it is very much clear that it is not just some didactic tool, but, so to speak, the real itself. Now, when it comes to anatomy, the anatomist and surgeon from 18th century, Dr. Jean Bell, said that an anatomy without illustrations is no better than a book of a geography without maps or Euclid without diagrams. It means that anatomical scientific illustrations have a specific epistemological meaning and that it is not just a decoration or a visual representation of the text. Therefore, if anatomical scientific illustrations have some epistemological value, this means that we actually came close to philosophy through the visual epistemology, which means that the distance between philosophy and anatomy is a little bit smaller. So maybe the alienation between these two discourses may not be so great. Well, let's see if we can reduce this distance, this alienation, a little more. Perhaps for this purpose, we can use the theme of our conference, alienation as such. To borrow a thought from Walter Kaufmann, alienation can be understood in terms of foreignness, strangeness, in the sense that something is alienated from us because it is foreign to us. And if we restore the ancient idea that philosophy begins in wonder, that it begins when something seems strange, foreign to us, 
then this would mean, according to Kaufmann, that philosophy itself was born out of alienation. What I want to show you in the following is that anatomy was also born from alienation. So if nothing else, we can say that the mutual alienated discourses of philosophy and anatomy meet at the point of their own alienated birth. They both, philosophy and anatomy, were born out of alienation. For this purpose, I will use and I will show you some examples of historical anatomical illustrations from the 15th to the 19th century, and I will use the concept of the anatomical body. Now, you probably notice that uh, I'm using this term anatomical body as something external, an additional signifier, and that I'm not simply talking about the body as such. I also explicitly said that it is the concept of the anatomical body, which means that I'm not making an equation between our body and our anatomical body. I don't know what exactly our body is. Is it our biological given? But I do know that the anatomical body is something we have obtained historically. So anatomy is a historical science, and the anatomical body is a concept of anatomy, but also an ideological signifier and category for identity that is historically constructed through different practices, not only scientific, but also cultural, political, legal, artistic, etc. Therefore, we can also talk about anatomical identity. Michael Sapol says that anatomical identity is so widespread today, that, but at the same time so implicit that it is not even noticed. Today, it seems normal for us, natural for us, to think of our body as an anatomical body, to understand the body itself as a structure, an anatomical architecture, which is quite a product of Western science and thought. The body as a design, we can say the design of God, and the anatomical body is the design of anatomical science. In this sense, anatomists possess special knowledge about something so important and so close to us as our body. Nos te ipsum, know thyself, in anatomy means to know the secrets of or laws of the anatomical body. And anatomy today enjoys the reputation of an objective science, but it wasn't always like that. Before the 16th century, anatomists had a low social reputation and were no more than butchers. From the very beginning, the role of anatomy was not well understood. The epistemological and practical value of anatomical knowledge was questioned. Medicine has always been somehow understood as practice and knowledge related to healing, to practice related to health and disease which means it deals with the living body. How then to justify an anatomy specializing in the dead bodies? So it is a very simple epistemological question. If the laws of the living are different from the laws of the dead, then of what value is the knowledge of the laws of the, a dead body to a living body? John Locke, for example, who worked closely with Dr. Thomas Siedemann, was skeptical about anatomical knowledge and argued that anatomical knowledge did not contribute much to the knowledge of disease. And there is also the question of methodology, method. Vivisections were practiced mostly on animals, probably also on the human body, but not much is written about it. Thus, the importance of dissection of a dead body for the medical treating a living body could not be directly understood. And dissection as a method of anatomy itself was not present from the beginning. 
So here we must highlight the revolutionary work of the greatest anatomist at the time, Andreas Vesalius, from the 16th century. In 1543, he published the capital book De Humani Corporis Fabrica, which actually means of the structure of the human body and which opened a new era in the history of biology and medicine, reforming anatomy into an objective scientific discipline based on direct empirical observation and the human body dissection. De Humani Corporis Fabrica is a masterpiece in yet another important aspect. It contains rich and exceptional illustrations of the dissected human body, including the magnificent cover with the woodcut of the artist Jan von Kalker. The anatomical illustrations from 16th and 19th century offered amazing depictions of the human anatomical body, which differ significantly from the anatomical illustrations of the 15th century. So, Let's take a look. The early illustrations were schematic, mostly representing the body in the form of a frog. So as you can see, they are very humble and basic. Now, Compare this with the illustrations from the De Humani Corporis Fabrica containing Vesalius' own and Jan von Kalker's illustrations. Just look at how they pose. So please remember. <laughs> Please remember that these are dead bodies. And these dead bodies are dramatically alive. So they don't look like lifeless pieces of flesh. They show the figure in motion. Also, there are, there are others anatomists, for example, the Anatomy of Bones by William Cheseldon, in which skeletons posed for the reader. Just like that. <laughs> I mean, look at these two. I mean, <laughs> absolutely incredible. Very alive, open skull with the brain. But yeah, just like that. So now we have flayed man holding his own skin, which resembles to, you probably know this picture, Sistine Chapel, yes, Michelangelo. And by the way, he and Leonardo da Vinci, Raffaello, they were all great anatomist artists. It is really a great research topic. This is, I mean, an incredible story behind this. But again, I, I cannot go into it right now, but totally sexy. <laughs> now we have um, also female body. I mean, <laughs> this is just so creative, so <laughs> aesthetic, beautiful. Of course, not without some comic exaggeration, flirtation, flirtation if you want. A strip show. <laughs> and yes, again, don't forget, these are dead dissected body. You can see dance macabre. A lot of motives like dance macabre, memento mori, vanitas combined with anatomical study. Very vivid, very artistic, so fun. The human body is depicted in dramatic positions, often in a natural or some sort of mythological setting. So the dead body is quite alive and seductive in these illustrations. 
when we look at these illustrations, we certainly do not think of disgusting human corpse. The body represented as a microcosmos, a living entity with exposed, open, dissected organs, religious and mythological motives of death, ecstasy, dance macabre, <clears throat> memento mori, and vanitas also presented. So in this context, surely the anatomist no longer looks like a butcher or someone who is disrespectful to death itself. I mean, maybe. So the anatomist is here God's artist, the master on earth, who is in the possession of the most important knowledge, knowledge about God's design, the human body. So this is the cover of Vesalius De Humani Corporis Fabrica. A lot of things is going on. I mean, it's so crowded. And uh, the picture also shows Vesalius himself touching the corpse. His hand of a scientist replaced the hand of God. And the hand of God, if the hand of God creates, the scientist analyzes, exhibits, dissect a pure formalization of the dead body into an object of scientific research is at work, which is, of course, no small thing. Descartes was also interested in the anatomy of the human body and formalized the body through, the, through his mechanistic philosophy. And precisely because of this, Descartes is the subject of much criticism today, which comes from cultural studies, because Descartes, Descartes sided with science, not culture. So formalizing the human body is not an easy process. You have to somehow kill what is already dead. And the genius of the anatomists from the 16th and 17th centuries was that they did this, paradoxically, by reviving the human dead body. They made it alive and attractive. So that was really great PR for anatomy. And just remember Rembrandt and his anatomy lessons. The famous, the anatomy lessons of the Dr. Nicolas Stulp but also a whole line of Dutch uh, artists representing anatomical lessons and anatomists. And anatomists are not portrayed as executioners, butchers. They hold public lectures and public dissections in anatomical theaters, special anatomical theaters. So you can look at them in Padua, Bologna, in many places in Europe. Everything was public. You could buy a ticket and come to watch the whole thing. So the dead body became a spectacular body, and anatomy became a matter of culture and, so to speak, theater. And not only that. At some point, anatomy and the law merged, and the dead body became a criminal body and also dissected body. So it was like a double punishment. Not only were criminals given the death penalty, but after the execution, there was another punishment, post-mortem punishment. The criminal's body was put to the service of anatomical science. So Rembrandt's painting shows the corpse of a real criminal. This was the moment when anatomy took on a legal role, a post-mortem punishment that was even greater punishment than the execution itself, because the post-mortem provoked total fear. So as Jonathan Sowday said, anatomy used alienated bodies, marginalized members of its own societies, criminals, the poor, lunatics, suicides, orphans, even simply strangers, as potential material for scientific practice. So the anatomical body had to be alienated from the dead body, and these were all ways of doing it. In its development, anatomy made this body spectacular, legal, cultural, alienated from the corpse, 
from the death that scares and brought this body closer to the death that teaches, that has a moral message. And also anatomists also had to develop a personal clinical detachment. They had to overcome the fear of the dead on a personal level, and they also had to free anatomy as the future science from the disgusting dead corpse. And this clinical separation, detachment, this uh, alienation effect took place in a crazy different way from Brecht's alienation effect. For both cases, the theater is topos. In the case of anatomy, it is literary anatomical theater. But the alienation is going in a different direction. The effect of alienation for Brecht means that the sense of the natural, the eternal, is interrupted and shown as historical, as intentionally caused and changed over time. The viewer cannot forget that he is watching a performance. There is no empathy for what is being watched, but there is an alienation effect. <laughs> With anatomical bodies from the 16th and 19th century, the whole point is in this drama, in this illusory effect. The anatomical body is alive precisely because it is dead. Alienation from a dead corpse means giving it a new dress, a new identity, an anatomical identity. And this is no longer our domestic body, but an anatomical body, a created body, a non-domestic body, an alienated body which precisely in his historical development of medical power will become our body, our new domesticity. So here we come to the second moment of alienation, not only alienation from dead body, but also alienation from one's own living body. This is a special moment that some authors associate with the symbolism of Med Medusa's head. It can be described as the Medusa effect. It is a special distance, foreness, alienation that we feel towards our own inner body. Medusa means fear of the inside. As Jonathan Sode says, the characteristic of our sense of the inside is that we can never experience it other than secondhand. So we can look into other bodies, but very rarely are we allowed to pick into our own. We can become familiar with the generalized topography of the body through different media, photo, x-rays, illustrations, anatomical demonstrations, but all of these journeys through the interior is just that it, it is happening, it is like encounters with bodies that are not our own. They are passages into the body, but not into my body, as Sovdays said. It is simply not possible to know one's own body, to know oneself in the physiological and anatomical sense. And the motto, nos se te ipsum, does not work in anatomical sense. We are denied a view of our internal organs. Sovade says the hidden geography, the hidden geography of the body is Medusa's head, which one glance blinds the presumptuous eye, denied the direct experience of ourselves, and with this inability to stare at one's own body, we can only explore body of the other through representation and trace through the formalization of the body, in other words, through the anatomical body. Thus, we are necessarily alienated from own body. Medusa's effect is an effect of mediation, alienation. And something similar can be found in the myth of, the, of Narcissus. Uh, Bara already described the modern narcissist yesterday, so I won't say too much on this, I will not state too much on this point. Maybe I would just add something that is related to my topic. 
when Natsus's mother, Liriope, in the third book of Ovid's Metamorphosis, asked a blind prophet, Tiresias, to tell her son's fate, he predicted a long life on the condition that he never know himself. Now, according to uh, Sigmund Bauman, modern culture directs modern narcissists to deal almost exclusively with knowing themselves. In a seminal study of modern narcissism, Christopher Lush predicted that the psychological man, that true product of bourgeois individualism, would soon be replaced by the economic man. The economic man, uh, the type of personality formed and bred by capitalist society in the current narcissistic stage. And it is, he is not haunted by guilt, but by anxiety. He does not try to impose his own strong beliefs on others, but rather tries to find the meaning of life. At the same time, he loses the security and experiences everyone as a rival. He is extremely competitive, competitive in, in his demand for approval and recognition. He demands immediate satisfaction and lives in a state of restless, internally unsatisfied desire. The passion that prevails today is to live for the moment, to live for oneself. And that demand to live for oneself is in total connection with the phrase to be true to ourselves, to do things our way. So the phenomenon of returning to the womb is seductively attractive in the current conditions of life, as Bauman said. The womb is a lonely place, but it is also safe. Inhabitant of womb, the fetus, would be self-evident object of the sum of its own concerns and interests. Self-tracking, self-evident object is the neoliberal ideal. But this demand to know oneself, to deal with oneself, also applies to the anatomical body. We may not have the opportunity to directly explore our own interi interior, but we constantly feel the direct demand to explore our anatomical body. We constantly deal with the anatomical medical body. The entire pharmacy, cosmetic, medical industry reports on this. Body care, hygiene, immunization have become cultural ethical and political imperative. Biomaterialism, as Badiou said, the anatomical body has become our anatomical self. Now, on the cover page of Fabrica, the anatomical universe revolves around the relation of womb and tomb. As so they says, the universe is neither geocentric nor, nor uh, heliocentric, but uterocentric. The womb is our point of origin, hence it's, uh, uh, it has its uh, center placement in the picture. But at the same time, it is a womb of a dead body, and there is a magnificent skeleton. I don't know if you can see it arising from the uterus. Nascentes morimur, we are born to die. But it is not that easy to die. We are so alienated from death that we forget to die. So memento mori, don't forget to die, well, we forget. We forget because we have an anatomical body that although it comes from the dead, establishes an interesting eternity in the corpse itself. It turned the corpse into a letter. So we all know that part in the Phenomenology of Spirit where Hegel addresses anatomy as the first example of pseudoscience. And if anatomy is a pseudoscience, then we do not have only anatomical identity, but also pseudo-identity. 
So according to Hegel, anatomy murdered its object and detached it from its organic unity and connection, the organische Einheit. Now, perhaps this statement of Hegel's seems a little strange. We have seen anatomical illustrations from the 16th and 19th centuries that showed everything but a dead body. And this body is also holistic. It represents a microcosm. We certainly cannot say that it is torn from some organic and cosmological connection. Well, yes, that's exactly it. Something changed already at the end of the 18th century. At the end of the 18th century, a new style appeared in anatomical illustrations. And uh, it was demanded that all aesthetic elements be abolished. The body cannot be just beautiful, alive, and dramatic. It has to be ugly, which means realistic. And those non-scientific and aesthetic elements will disappear from the middle of the 19th century, where the body will be presented fragmented and realistic. The total ideal of the new visual representation of the organs of the human body will be the non-aesthetic scientific realism that still dominates anatomy today, the rhetoric of the real thing. So let's see it. human body becomes fragmented, brutal, ugly. So we have one interesting gap between the holistic understanding of man as a microcosm and the new understanding of the anatomical identity of the fragmented body. No devi deviations, no correspondences between the anatomical body and the moral, political, social reality. No fun just an almost fetishistic attachment to descriptive detail. From now on, science deals with the real. There is no connection between art and science. As Sapolo says, art was given everything else, moral, history, aesthetic, metaphor, myth. Everything changed, and we are dealing here with epistemological panic. And this is actually my new research topic, this epistemological panic. So in my future work, I would like to formulate the concept of anatomical visual episteme, short, AVE, to, to map possible changes in, of anatomical visual episteme and epistemological visual breaks in the historical development of anatomy from the 15th to the 19th century. And finally, to determine the role of different historical visual epistemes in the constitution of contemporary image of human anatomical body. So I actually need this extensive four-century period from 15th to 19th century to be able to detect possible epistemological breaks. And yes, to conclude, this new realistic style, fragmentation, is continuation of the process of alienation. Our anatomical bodies have now become even more distant and alienated in relation to nature, the cosmos, in relation to ourselves. So anatomical organs became distant from each, each other, alienated, specialized. Anatomical alienation is the formalization of a dead body into a dead letter, but at the same time, it is a new cultural identity, which means alienation also leads to identification. We are ad identified as anatomical beings. I don't know if the process of alienation will continue, but I am somehow convinced that possible alienation from anatomical identification will lead to the creation of a new identity. But for now, we have the anatomical self that also looks like this. <laughs> so yes, these are pictures I took yesterday from a shop very close to us. 
And as you can see, the commercial cosmetic brand creates our trust through the human skeleton. It is a symbol of medical science, Mr. Bone. And yes, um, also in New York, Italy, I mean everywhere. So we leave the anatomical body in school, in science, in shops. We put it also on the cross. It became our new religion. And um, this last photo shows the actual human body of the criminal being examined after the execution, post-mortem. The artists wanted to show that Christ was anatomically wrong represented. So obviously, the anatomical body is also the path to religion. Anatomy will reduce our alienation from religion, will reduce alienation between our bodies and the body of Christ. So it will show exactly what the body on the cross should look like. Thank you. Thank you, Magdalena, for this picturesque lecture. So, um, yeah, questions? Okay, um, first. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, Magdalena, I wanted to thank you so much again for a yes, very picturesque talk. And I, I had a, a very specific question. Um, there was, there was a, a fascinating section where you, uh, sort of, where you discuss uh, the alienation from our own anatomical body, from our own insides, as it were. And, and, and not to be a nitpick, but it, 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 uh, it was, uh, I immediately thought of um, uh, Leonid uh, Rogozhev, uh, he, he was a, a surgeon in 1962 who uh, was one of the very few to actually uh, perform surgery on himself, abdominal surgery. Uh, and there is a sort of list of these truly bizarre cases of people performing surgery on themselves, be they surgeons or veterinarians or people just forced out of circumstance. Um, and uh, I'm not offering this as a, as a counterexample or anything, just I think perhaps a very fascinating case of uh, they're like a small club of people who have looked within themselves, right? Yeah. And uh, I was wondering whether your position would be that as a physician, uh, you know, doing this, would they have had to have been alienated perhaps even more from their internals in order to, yeah. uh, to, 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 to operate in such a way? Or did they actually have some sort of Congress, uh, you know, that, that, that we can't, uh, that most of us couldn't even imagine? Mm, yes. Well, um, I'm not sure how they manage, but uh, that uh, phenomenon of clinical detachment is something very important for, um, for um, anatomists and uh, the people who are <laughs> in a position to do that kind of things. Um, and yes, um, it, um, there is also, also a lot of uh, psychological studies on that uh, subject, actually, what kind of um, personality you have to have to be in possibility to, to do this kind of thing. But I do not believe in <laughs> personal studies and psychological studies, so I, 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 I would like to think that they, they, that they are aliens. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I was surprised that you um, did not talk about the gaze. I was surprised uh, that you did not go on to make some remarks about how the medical gaze, right, as it evolved in the West, uh, took on this form. And it's very clear to us that um, what the gaze became was, was that it, it was penetrating, right? It is a penetrating kind of gaze. 
that required the body to be uh, broken open and, mm. and going deeper and deeper into the into the body. So, so having studied Foucault and the birth of the clinic and so forth, you, you, so I, I was wondering if you would like to say something about the historical development of the um, Western medical case, because as you suggested, not all uh, medicine systems around the world <clears throat> develop by cutting open the, the dead body, right? In fact, it's a very unique way of um, coming to terms with mm. human health. If you look around the world, mm. no one uh, does work on the dead body as we have seen mm. coming out of uh, Europe. So I think it's a, it's a really fascinating historical development. Yes, so. yes, totally agree, thank you. I totally, totally agree. Um, I didn't uh, choose that part only because it is very complex uh, topic and uh, for me very, very important topic because Foucault is for me also a very important uh, author. Um, and um, um, uh, it, is, uh, it is just like that um, uh, in, in Europe we developed that uh, whole culture of dissection uh, and also case is, uh, is something that constituted it. Uh, and it is um, uh, actually very uh, complex uh, story from epistemological point of view. Um, uh, and totally agree, it is very Western <laughs> style of uh, looking and, uh, um, and thinking and analyzing, analysis. I mean, it is very <laughs> dissected mode of thinking. Um, so yes, um, um, I, I just uh, choose this uh, part uh, just maybe to have a little bit of fun because this is very <laughs> serious conference, and uh, I wanted to to <laughs> to to, to, uh, to create a little break. Um, so, but yes, uh, this is my topic of research. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I was, I mean, this is more of a comment just because uh, it just struck me that um, that you have, uh, at, at least in, in Plato, but, but in, in the uh, ancient Greek tradition, uh, and this is something I've learned, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm, of course, not an expert on the, on the issue, but, they, uh, but the first concept for uh, a body as a totality, as a, as a mm -hmm. unified object, is soma, which yes. is a dead body, or the body from which the soul has left its place. And then Plato plays on this in Cratylus dialogue with Soma and Sema and so, I don't remember, but Sema being a, a, a sign basically or, or um, signifying then also a prison. Uh, so it's just interesting that, that there's, I mean, it seems to be in Western tradition that, that you somehow, that the body is already, uh, I mean, something in, 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 in the way in which uh, the, let's say the dualism or something like that, that the body has always somehow been uh, a dead body. I mean, you see it also in the ancient Greek art that you have basically a, a body, a, a living body is composed out of these joints, basically. It's not really uh, a, a unified body in its uh, image imagery either. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, this was just a, a thought, a comment uh, mm -hmm. about exactly this, why the dead body somehow uh, is so central. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for your comment, yes. Um, totally agree, and uh, because that, uh, I think it is very interesting to explore that epistemological breaks um, also in relation to understanding of that body. So how we, uh, how we are now in the situation that we have that fragmented body, for example, in science. Um, I mean, in a culture, we have spectacular body worlds, exhibitions, uh, which are uh, quite different. But yes, thank you. Okay, so Bara, and then we have Gregor and Ross and Laurent and Nathan. So. Oh, so many questions, <laughs> yeah, but... Okay, um, I'll be quick. I'll just, um, like, the first association that I had was um, in relation to Charcot's uh, theater of hysteria, because uh, so I, I wonder how you, you would relate these two theaters. Um, as we know, Chacot was like is now uh, like 
um, believed to be both the father of, of, um, of neurology and at the end, psychoanalysis. And the, the other com connection is also the womb, you know, the, the, the uterus. And I just, uh, if you can maybe uh, see this from the perspective of the relation between life and that, you know, you know, this, yes. this is the question. Thank you, Bada. Uh, actually, yes, I mean, there is one uh, beautiful book, uh, Spectacular Bodies, um, that uh, they, uh, Martin Kemp, uh, wrote it. Um, I mean, he he started with the, the the historical development of anatomy, like a very simple, <laughs> very similar <laughs> like me. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. I mean, um, um, what I wanted to say that yes, he um, he actually um, bring that moment also. Uh, so doing that uh, uh, historical development of anatomy. In, uh, it was very important to come to uh, the question of his hysteria and uh, the all uh, uh, but, um, um, an uh, exhibition of uh, mental body, if you want. So it is uh, really, really, I mean, uh, um, important topic, yes. Uh, so we should think that together, totally. Thank you. This is very interesting research. My question is uh, coming from, of course, my interest in German idealism, um, specifically, uh, specifically Fichte and Hegel, who uh, were writing in the period where anatomy became the paradigm of science. It was basically, you know, soon after uh, Mary Shelley wrote the Frankenstein novel, there was anatomy was like the science, and in a sense they had to define philosophy both in distinction from anatomy and, you know, as being an obvious ally of anatomy. So I'm just, I suppose I'm just wondering what you make of Hegel's uh, specifically or Fichte's takes on uh, ana anatomy as at the same time something that um, works as precisely that what philosophy is also supposed to do but at the same time, I think, at least, uh, at least in, in Fichte, uh, you would also see anatomy as the opposite of what a philosophy must do, in the sense that, obviously, uh, what you are interested in uh, scientifically is the functioning of the living body, and therefore, by studying corpses, you are making some sort of a mistake. <laughs> You're making the Frankenstein monster, basically. Um, I don't know, I mean, this is, this is kind of, uh, have, have you, did you go in this direction as well, or do you plan to? Yes, thank you, thank you, Gregor, so much. Um, I actually, I would like to explore in the future um, more uh, the relation between historical development of anatomy and Hegel's point on anatomy. And luckily for me, <laughs> I made contact with uh, Michael Sapol, who gave me excellent input. He suggested to us uh, to also check work of uh, Samuel, Samuel Hahnemann, I think. He was founder of, uh, founder of homeo homeopathy. And uh, his uh, major treats, uh, the Organon, was uh, also published like only a few years after the phenomenology of the spirit. So Hegel's critic of anatomy uh, is very similar, like, like his. And um, uh, the critic of anatomy as a science, uh, a science only of uh, the dead body, um, was actually circulated widely in that period. Um, so Hegel definitely was, wasn't the only one, and um, uh, also uh, Goethe and Kant, uh, they also engaged with anatomy. So it is a very, very interesting uh, topic for, for researching, so that, that is my total ambition to go in that direction. Um, and uh, I also, uh, I mean, I already, I already started with this because uh, um, Sopolo sent me a catalog of Hegel's uh, library. And um, uh, there, there are a lot of works of natural science that Hegel owned. 
So I started with researching this. So uh, and uh, I don't know. I mean, also it also it is very important to 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 think about uh, phrenology because uh, a, a lot of pages of uh, phenomenology of the spirits uh, uh, arguing against phren uh, phrenology. So yeah, I think that it is very very interesting topic of of, uh, um, of crossing between romantic and idealist philosophy and anatomy. So yeah, I I think that we should do that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. <laughs> if you have stupid question, please. I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I like stupid questions. Question. 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 Just yeah, yeah, to know. yeah. It has no relationship whatsoever with the history. Yeah, of yeah, the uh, yeah. A, a lot of drama caused actually in that uh, that whole exhibitions and yeah. I mean, uh, it is very interesting because it is very, very uh, similar with these anatomical illustrations from 16th, 19th century. So a lot of spectacularity around the body. So uh, I think that we uh, we we need also to take that into account. I mean, in science, we have that realism, this uh, ugly body, <laughs> and in culture, we have this spectacular body. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, so, I have a, a kind of recommendation. Um, I'd like to recommend to you the, the work of uh, the vegan grindcore death metal band Carcass who I think you'd really appreciate. And in particular, their first two albums, 1988 and 1989, Reek of Putrefaction and Symphonies of Sickness, the front covers of which, the, the artwork was banned in the United Kingdom. And they were made by the bassist and one of the lead singers um, from, by him borrowing his sister, who was, who was training as a nurse, borrowing her anatomical textbooks and cutting them up and sticking them together to make these, these covers. Um, and there is a kind of philosophical justification for this that he kind totally. of comes out with. So anyway, that, so that's, that's, that's a kind of recommendation. They're also really good. They're the best ever band to come from Merseyside in the United <laughs> Kingdom, hands down. Um, so, but I do have a question. Uh, I, w I was persuaded by your account of a transition in anatomical representation around the end of the 18th century and into the 19th. I suppose what I'd like to ask her, and, and, and to put a little bit of pressure on, is, is whether this is a retreat from an aesthetic presentation of anatomy. And ra rather, because in some senses it seemed to me still aesthetic, whatever that means. But a retreat instead rather from a kind of theatrical presentation of anatomy to a kind of textual and graphic one. So I suppose I just wanted to hear a little bit more about why you think that it's a kind of de-aestheticizing um, of, of the presentation of, of anatomy. Um, mm. And how, how committed you are to that kind of way of viewing it. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you. Well, thank you <laughs> for <laughs> everything you suggested. Um, great. Uh, well, actually, of course, uh, I mean, it is maybe too strong word aesthetic because it is also aesthetic also if I think that it is ugly. I mean, I don't think it is ugly. I like this fragmented body. <laughs> uh, this, I mean, beautiful. So um, it is, there is also a presence of some style. So we cannot say that there is no style. It is style, aesthetic, realistic style, if you want. Uh, a very fetishistic style, maybe. So um, yeah, I, I, um, I use that word. Um, well, I don't know why. Maybe because, uh, maybe because um, um, anatomical illustrations from 16th, 19th centuries, uh, they, they were made by artists um, in the most of the case. And anatomists, they just helped them. But then, um, the, I know, it started with changes, especially in 
in that particular point that the anatomist started to to uh, to make that pictures um, and I think that uh, the, the the principle of reality of empirical observation was also present in the 16th and 19th century of course but just the mode how you present that and what kind of interest you have behind that presentation is maybe what is different because uh, as I said uh, at the beginning uh, anatomist had a very a very low reputation, so they had to do a lot of PR. And in 19th century, uh, anatomy already be, already got that status. Um, so yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, I think we're out of time. So thank you again, Magdalena. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.